Here that we miss the place of the, the different confusion in the place of the, of the seminar. Okay, I'm sorry for the delay, but it seems important people always make other people away. <laughs> I was in the other lecture. So thank you for being here. Um, because I have to I have to start with some bad news and I did my talk. The bad news is that I will talk about something in which I'm not an expert. So <laughs> it may be that not everything is mathematically exact or even correct. Okay? But I also have some good news, and the good news is that I'm talking about something in which I'm not an expert. So I will try to explain uh, more also partly with intuition and with examples. Of course, in one hour time, it's difficult to really, I mean, cover the whole thing that is possible. And so I have another apology to make. That is because I will talk about this subject because at the end of the talk, I want to present you one of the most exciting results that I've obtained in my scientific career very recently. And this result is expressed in terms of large education. So this is the reason why I would like to talk about this. I will give to Perry a copy of the slides. I don't give them in advance, so it's a little bit of a surprise. And so uh, if there are mistakes, you can tell me afterwards. Um, so let's start. So I will start with things you probably know very well. And also, also I, 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 I'm supposed to know very well. Uh, and then I will, I will try to show you that there, surprisingly there, there is something more hidden behind all these results and this has been gone unnoticed for, for quite a long time. So, this is really so I would like to start with the law of large numbers. So you know, let's give an example. I have some identically distributed independent random variables. Uh, with same average mu and a certain same dispersion sigma, so it's like measurement of the same experiment. And I repeat the measurement and I make the average. So I do this and I introduce this uh, variable x, which is the ensemble average of these measurements. And of course, you know, the law of large numbers states that this quantity <coughs> will converge to the mean. And actually, the reason why this concept was introduced at all here for the first time in a book. Uh, by Bernoulli is because they wanted to have a way to obtain precise measurements when your measurement apparatus is not so well functioning as it was in that time. So how do you how do you get such a result? Let, let's show a proof. Okay, so this is the variable I'm looking at. It's this uh, random variable. So let's first calculate the average. Of course, the average is the sum of the averages. Each of them is equal to mu. So this sum has n terms. So this, of course, reproduces mu. So the average of the quantity is certainly the mu that we want. But of course you want something more. Uh, let's look at the deviations from this average, delta x, and let's see how, how large these deviations are. So for that you calculate, of course, the dispersion. So this square average, so you just rewrite the square average, so it's delta of this is sum of delta of that twice, so I need an other index, of course, to separate the two summations, and I take the average. Now assume that these variables, xi and xj, are independent of each other. They have the same mean. So whenever the indices i and j are different, the product factorizes, but each delta xi or delta xj is zero. So the only terms that count here are those for which i are equal to j. And then this is just a dispersion of this variable here, which I call sigma squared. And now you see, of course, that you have a double sum, but because of the corner delta, only one sum remains. So I have n terms divided by the n squared, because I have squared this thing. So I get the quantity sigma squared divided by n equals to 0. So already we are happy. We get the first feeling, OK, yes, so this means that these deviations go to 0. So in some way, px, a probability distribution for this quantity, x goes to delta function centered at mu. If you want to be a little bit more precise, you could use, for instance, Chibichess inequality, which tells you what, for a given variance of a random variable, what is the probability to be away from the average by a certain amount. This is a rigorous general inequality you find in the textbooks. And if you apply to this guy here, because the, the, the sigma x is known, and oh, there should be sigma x here, sorry. This is the first mistake. 
you get this 1 over square root of n from this guy here. And so indeed, the probability of having a finite deviation from the average goes to 0 when n goes to 3. This is called the weak law. You have a stronger law, which says that x goes to mu with probability 1. Okay, so you, mathematicians are very good at refining what we understand. There's so, no yeah? There's no yeah, but, ah, yes. So um, there are some comments, of course, to make. So this proof here works, of course, if this quantity is finite, but you don't need that sigma square is really finite. It could be you could still have law of large numbers even if this diverges, so people have looked at it. The most important remark I have to make for the following is that you understand that this result will also remain valid if these guys, they could be correlated, but not all of them together. So if there is a weak correlation, you can still expect that this result will hold. And this is especially interesting if instead of summing over a number of measurements, I, for instance, integrate over time. So it's also, I'm kind of making a time average now instead of an ensemble average. If this process here is, not, is weakly correlated in time so that the integral of the correlation function, for instance, exists, you can do something similar as I did here. You can again prove that this x will converge to some average value with deviations that become very, very small. OK, so this is the first step. And then there is a second step. Let's notice uh, something amusing about the result that I had. So I calculated the mean of this variable. I calculated the dispersion of this variable. Now, if you look at this guy here, so I subtract the mean from x. And then I blow up. So I know it converges to mu. But I want to see how. So that's a trick that we know in physics very well. You blow up this uh, quantity here. And you know what is the amount you need, because you see it here. Uh, you blow it up by, with square root of n, and you divide by sigma. Then you immediately see that this is a quantity. Of course, average is 0, and dispersion 1. Okay. Now, this is then um, the first ingredient of something that you also know. This is the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem tells you that in this case, of course, of independent identically distributed independent random variables, it's easy to prove. Uh, we'll, we'll see it. This quantity here converges to mu. This I showed, and in the way I showed it. But if you subtract mu from it, you multiply by square root of n, and you divide by sigma, and you then take the limit and go to infinity. So I've blown up the, the uh, deviations. I get a normal distribution. So it's a distribution with average zero, dispersion one. But on top of that, the central limit theorem says it's a, it's not any distribution. It's a normal. Distribution. So how would you prove that? Well, you could be, I mean, like going on as we did before, try to see that. Let me check if it's a normal. So let's go on. Let's take the third sample moment. For a normal distribution, normal distribution is an even distribution. The third sample moment should be 0. So let's check if this guy in the limit n goes to infinity becomes uh, a variable with uh, zero third moment. So this is the third moment. It's exactly the same calculation as I did for the second one, except for three sums. Again, two indices have to be equal. Uh, all three indices, sorry, have to be equal. Otherwise, you always have one guy who averages out to zero. So I have two delta chronicle functions. And then when all three are the same, then this is the uh, skewness of this original variable. And then you have the same thing here. You have three sums. But you have two delta functions, so one sum survives. This is n terms. And so this goes like 1 over n squared. Okay. And then you can check this guy here. So I have now to multiply with square root of n. So this is basically multiplying with n to the 3 halves. But I divide by n squared. So this third cumulant, well, so I have this third decentral moment indeed goes to 0. It goes to 0 like 1 over square. Of course, now you say, OK, this is very tedious. I have to go on. I mean, this is OK for the third moment. But what about higher order moments? And here we come, we will introduce, so we are partly happy here. We introduce uh, something that will be very important for us for the uh, story that follows. You probably know the moment generating function. And some of you, or maybe all of you, know the cumulant generating function. But let me tell you what these things are. So let's take again this random variable x. I multiply with some weight parameter, control parameter, or whatever, lambda. 
I take the exponent and I average. Now, of course, the exponent I can expand. You know, the expansion of the exponent is the sum of this thing to the power k divided by k factorial. So this gives me, if I now make the average, which only works on x, gives me this expression. So this is why this is called the moment generating function. Because if I know this function here is a function of lambda only, if I know it and I do its Taylor expansion, I get the moment, provided the moment exists. That's not maybe too difficult, so in the moment exists like But there is another interesting development to make, and I will tell you in a moment why, but let's first do it. Let's take the logarithm of this quantity. It's also a function of lambda. For lambda equals zero, this quantity is exponential. Of zero is one, so log of one is zero, so it starts in zero. It's a function of lambda, which starts in zero for lambda equals zero, but okay, I can try to expand it for small p function of lambda. And so I will have an expansion which now starts for, with the linear term because the, zero, the, the constant term is 0, as I just showed. So I have an expansion of this kind. And the quantities that appear here are called the cumulants. OK? They are called the cumulants. And for this reason, this guy here is called the cumulant generating function. So if you have this thing, you calculate this average, you take the logarithm, you expand it in lambda, you find the coefficients. These coefficients give you the cumulants. What is the relation between both? Well, it's easy, of course. If I take the exponent of this, I have to get this back. So I take the exponent of this sum, and I have to get back this thing. And so I can expand this sum. I know what this is. The, it looks like a very tedious procedure, but I can do it, of course. Expand this exponent, and then identify, of course, the same exponents of lambda. And if you do that, you will find that the first cumulant is the first moment, the second cumulant is the dispersion, is the second sample moment, the third cumulant is the third sample moment, and then you think you're, you're there, but it's not true. The third cumulant is the, the fourth sample moment minus three times the square of the dispersion, and so on. So this is actually okay, but it's not so very interesting to know what cumulants are. So what you have to do is you have to do a choice of the probability distribution that is interesting. And this choice is the Gaussian distribution. This is a Gaussian distribution for x, average mu and dispersion sigma squared. And as you know, that's all that the, that the Gaussian distribution has, these two moments. It's all, and we will see immediately what this implicates. So this is the probability distribution everybody knows. And I want to calculate the cumulant generating function. So what do I have to do? I have to calculate the average of this guy. So this average is exponential of lambda x times the probability distribution integrated over all x. And I have to take the logarithm. This is this thing. And if I expand this, I should find the cumulant for this guy. But look, this is very easy. What you do is you expand here the square. You get an x squared minus 2 mu x plus mu squared. What I now do is I complete the square. I, inter I introduce the lambda x in with the minus 2x mu divided by 2 sigma square. And I complete the square again. You know what I'm talking about? I hope. So if you do that, you get an extra term, which is a constant term. The previous thing becomes, again, a Gaussian integral, which is 1. The extra term is an exponential of something. You calculate it. You take the logarithm, and this is what you find. Okay. So what do you find? The Gaussian distribution can be very easily characterized by the following very important property. It's a distribution for which only the two first units are finite and all the others are zero. Okay, so these of course are these two ones because it has to be and all the other units are zero. <coughs> so uh, all units out of the first two are zero for Gaussian distribution. So that is something that is in the reason, we will see one of the reasons why of course, the central limit theorem appeared because of the special problem. Now, at this moment, I want, because I will use the cumulant generating function later on, I just want also to mention another very important general property of the cumulant generating function. Uh, and this property is the following. Suppose that I take the cumulant generating function, I'm sorry, I forgot to put this I call g of lambda. So it's not a mistake in transparency. So I call the cumulant generating function the point a lambda plus b mu. So the cumulant generating function is the logarithm of the average of exponential of 
a lambda plus b mu x, but I can rewrite it in this way. And now there is a famous inequality, Holder inequality, which tells you that this average is more than this average. Okay, I, cannot, I will not prove it, but you can find it in the textbooks. And the result is that the cumulant generating function satisfies this property, which some of you will recognize. This means that this cumulant generating function is a convex function as a function of lambda. So I should maybe I will plot it later. It's a function that has a shape, I mean, uh, that in such a way that if I take two points on the function and link them, the line that links them always lies above the function. This is a convex function. Well, concave is the other one. Convex, I always, V from convex, V is like that. So this is where I'm It's a convex function. It's a convex function. Okay? Not necessarily strictly convex. It could have parts that are linear. It's not that it is a convex function. But there's a very important property that. OK, so let's come back to the central limit theorem. This is this quantity. And now, of course, I have a much better way to see how I can prove a central limit theorem because I should focus on the cumulant generating function of this quantity because I know that if it goes to a Gaussian, the cumulant generating function should tell me that all the cumulants except the first two go to zero. So I calculate the cumulant generating function of this guy. Okay? So as I said, it's exponential of lambda x in the logarithm, and I fill in what this is. Okay, I've done it here. And now this can be very easily simplified. First, because the exponent of a sum is the product of the exponents. And second, because all these variables are independent of each other, so actually this um, and identically distributed. So this average is the same as the average of the first one. And I have n of them. So I have this to the power n, so to say, which I put in front of the logarithm, and I get this result. Okay. So now I can use, uh, I can try to find out what are the cumulants. This is the cumulant generating function for this, for this guy. This is this expansion. Okay. This thing is a cumulant generating function. So here I have the, I have the cumulants. But this is also the cumulant generating function for this variable x n, but with variable lambda over m. So it's the same expression as here, except that x is x1. And lambda is divided by, lamb by m. So I get an n to the k. But I have to multiply by m. So I get an n I'm to sorry, the k. I got, I got lost here. What is the meaning of the first equation? Why, why are we now doing that? This is this random variable. It's okay. a sum of okay. Okay. the. Okay, so this is what I thought. So why, why in the last step you substitute the sum of x i? with n times x1. So there, this is an average of this quantity for variable x1, an yes. average for variable x2, for variable x3. But they are identically distributed random variables. So okay. these, var these averages are the same. They are all the same. The number one is equal to number two, and so on. And there are n factors here. So it's, it's this guy to the power n, but the n I've put in front of the logarithm. The logarithm of a to the power yeah, n is n logarithm. Yes? OK, you can check the detail of the calculation if you don't believe it. So the point is now, so this, I get, a re, I get an explicit expression for the cumulants of this guy in terms of the cumulants of this uh, simple guy. Okay. So I wrote it there. You see, basically, this guy is equal to this guy divided by n to the power k minus 1. And of course, you recognize what I had before. For k equal 1, I have that the average of x is the average of x1. It's mu. The second cumulant, which is the dispersion, is the second cumulant of a single variable divided by n. This is what I had before, which I can see. But all the other guys, you see, for if you, if you now, what did I do before? I, I subtracted mu. OK, I can subtract mu. And then I amplify the deviations by a square root of n. If I amplify the deviations by a square root of n, it's to the power k. It's like I multiply by n to the power k over 2. But I have this factor here. And you see that this cumulants, indeed, when k is larger than 2, all go to zero. OK? So this is not the central point of my talk. I mean, this is just, so this central limit there, of course, was first divided by Sometimes the Moivre Laplace, so it's, you don't know who was the first. The Moivre did it for the binomial distribution. And actually, that it, the, the, the proof is actually finding the beginning of the Stirling formula. Because you have to find the log of 
of n factorial. So anyway, so what we more or less proved, and again, I mean, what this statement really means, I will not reveal in, de in mathematical detail, but so we have the impression, at least, that if you take this random variable x, you subtract nu, you divide by square root of n for n large, this becomes a Gaussian a normal distribution. Okay. Now, this calculation here will be the starting point for a new story. And I will make the following observation. So actually, this is uh, what, what I would like to observe. So if I, not, if I, instead of looking at x, what is x? So I'm dealing with a variable, I'm accumulating independent measurements, or I integrate in time of variables that are not strongly correlated, and then I'm, I in a sense average by dividing by the number or dividing by the time. So I'm looking at a random variable in which there is a large parameter in play, but the variable I look at, I scale back. So it's not growing with this variable. It's, of course, this is the idea, it's conversion to some average. But let's, so, in a sense, you could say, I use this word, that this is kind of intensive with respect to n. So n becomes larger and larger, and x is in, is, is in the in long run, actually becomes average. It's not growing. But let's look at nx, at this variable, nx. So is this sum here, OK? So and let's look at the cumulants of this guy. The k cumulant of this guy is, of course, just the k cumulant of x by itself multiplied by n to the power k. And I calculated here what is the cumulant of x to the k is the, this given value, this is what you have for one measurement, it's one, divided by n to the k minus one, but so if I multiply it by n to the k, I find that all the cumulants of this extensive variable are the same, uh, well, at the same end It's not that one is growing or decaying fast, but growing faster than any other. So this gives you a little bit a strange feeling because in the central limit theorem tells you about, well, you have a lot of large numbers, so mu is one thing, and then the correction to that is the second moment. But if I look at this property here, I don't see this distinction between moment one, two, or higher order moment. So there is something more to the story, and this is what I will tell you, this is the story of large so what is the interesting quantity that we will um, measure? And I will give you the next slide a theorem about it. And then I will try to explain you a little bit more. So again, let's look at this case, the sum of in identically distributed independent random variables. And I look at this guy. OK. Now let's calculate the following thing. I calculate the cumulative generating function, not of x, but of nx. So it's just that here I have to, I replace lambda by n times lambda, then this guy goes out. <coughs> and then I divide by n, then this guy goes out. So if I look at this quantity, it's a number. It doesn't depend on n anymore. Actually, in this case, because the variables are independent of each other, it's always a constant for any n, OK? But typically, you have to take the limit if there is like weaker relations, so we have to take the limit of this quantity for n large to find a number. <coughs> so this is the interesting quantity to look at. So let me repeat. I have a random variable, which is a kind of, it reflects a kind of accumulation of something, but I make it intensive, you see, by device. So it's things that may be correlated, maybe time series, weakly correlated, so on. But then I divide it by time, then I get this quantity. But I'm not going to look again at this quantity. I multiply it again with this parameter, for instance, n. I take the cumulant generating function and divide by this quantity. And I take the limit of n going to infinity or t going to infinity or whatever the parameter is. If this limit exists, this is called the scaled cumulant generating function because I have this n sitting there and there. If this limit exists, then I have a principle of large limit. So let me tell you what it implies. Okay? So this is what is called the garner ellis theorem. So let me read. I have a random variable that depends on the parameter, which I, I have to use a notation. So I have to use an n because this is the example I use. <coughs> this is a parameter that becomes large. Okay? Uh, and 
then I calculate for this quantity. I, so here, I, uh, so normally I omit it, but I, x is, of course, it's a random variable. But it depends, of course, on how many measurements you've done. So it's a random variable, it depends on n. So that's why I put it here. So if this limit exists, we saw it exists, for instance, for this independent random variable. OK? I, then we can get it. If this limit exists, so if this scaled cumulant generating function exists, then the probability distribution of x satisfies a large deviation principle. So what I'm going to say now is, you see, I started with the law, law of large numbers, which says p of x converges to delta of x minus mu. And I said, well, if you blow it up and you look at this square root of n of x minus 2 divided by sigma, you get a normal random variable. But actually, there is more under the carpet than that. And this is what this large deviation principle says. The large deviation principle says that for large n, if this is true, for large n, the probability distribution to observe a certain value of this intensive variable, I call it an x, this probability is exponentially small in this parameter n. So there is a function, and this is called the large deviation function, such that this p of x, up, if you take n large enough, the dominant order will depend maybe on other n dependencies, but the dominant n dependence is a decreasing n dependence in this way. So with a pure exponent. And the, so what it basically means that you see, you, you see, of course, the convergence to the delta function. Everything becomes unlikely, exponent, but exponentially fast. So this is something I didn't say before. This i of x, but typically I didn't write it because in general, this, this is the term, the way it's stated. Typically, well, not typically, but most of the time, i of x will be positive everywhere. So the, the decrease will be exponential everywhere, except in one point where it's zero, and this is the point, this is for instance x equals mu, this is the point that carries all the probability. But there could be more than one, that's why it's not stated here as a result. I mean, I don't see anything about an average. I'll see that in a minute, actually, that it can be. So this is a mathematical theorem, so that's why it's made. So, but it means if I measure x for large sample sizes, I can see, you see that from where the name comes, I can see large deviations, so I can see not mu, but two mu and three mu, and so on, things that are very unlikely. But the probability, you see them, are exponentially small in n. Okay. Furthermore, what is the relation between these two guys? Well, for that, you need an additional uh, property, and I will, in a minute here, try to explain you from where you come. If this function, f of lambda, is everywhere differentiable, Okay. It's a convex function. Remember I told you, because of the Holder inequality, you can show that the cumulant generating function, this is a cumulant, this is a scale cumulant generator, but it's a cumulant generating function anyway, this is a function of lambda. This function is convex, but if in addition it's differentiable, then this quantity is a Legendre transform of f of lambda and is also convex. Okay? So this is here. The Legendre, so this is a convex function. This is the Legendre transform of a convex function. It's another convex function. Okay? But it's not, it's not always true. It's true only when this guy is, uh, when this guy is differential. Okay? And then, of course, you know the inverse of, of, of if you do twice a Legendre transformation, you get back the original function. So you also have that f of lambda is a Legendre transform of this free function. So from where does this come? So a plausibility proof, you will see that basically the ingredient has to do with Laplace methods for approximating integrals in which there is a large parameter. And so I will, I will actually prove it not in this way but in the other way. So suppose that I have, so from here to there, suppose that I have a probability distribution that asymptotically has this shape. Let's calculate this quantity here, okay? So the average of the exponent of lambda and x. So this is integral here. Now asymptotically means, so here I'm only going to use only the terms that are dominant when n is large. And according to the large deviation principle, this probability distribution will have all values. But 
uh, with an exponentially small probability and described by this rate function or large deviation function alpha. So I just insert this. I put the n in front, and then I suppose you know this Laplace method. So this integral here, of course, will be will the, the, the dominant contribution of this integral will come from the largest value of what is standing here in the exponent, right? This exponential of n times a function, exponential of n times a function of x. When n is large, of course, you just have to see where is this function maximum. That's what is, will be the dominant contribution. So the dominant contribution is exponential of n times the maximum value that lambda x minus i x has over the interval. And you see then, if this is true, if you take the logarithm and you divide by n, which is precisely what I do to calculate log by f of lambda, I have to take log if this goes out and divide by n, I get the maximum. So I get this problem here that f of lambda is the maximum of lambda x. Now, without going into the details, where does this differentiability come from? Well, here I made a kind of assumption uh, when I say the maximum. It could be that, for instance, there are more than one maximum. They could be equal. Okay. So you see that from the moment that i of x is not a convex function, it could have different maxima. You, 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 don't, uh, you, you, can, you, you cannot uh, immediately write down what will happen here. So I will, I will give an example of the reverse. If you don't prove that it is satisfied the large deviation, then the general differential is. You have not proven the other one. No. Okay. No. You mean if this is true, this is true? Yeah. yeah. You say if yeah. the, the, yes. the cumulative yes. function satisfies this, then yes. satisfies the large deviation. And you have proven the opposite. Yes. This is what I said. I proved you. Why? I mean, I, this is a possibility. Yeah. And I said I, I work in your it's a maximum. Huh? Yeah, so you, yeah, I should make, I'm so used to it now. So you see, there is a notation convention. Eh? Probability, of course, cannot, I mean, probability uh, cannot explode. I mean, probability is normalized. So this quantity has to be, cannot go to plus infinity. So. That's why this i of x with the minus sign, this i of x has to be positive. These things all go to zero, huh? except in one point, maybe in one point, maybe in more than one point, which carry all of part of the probability. Okay. That's why this, uh, with this minus sign, I have that i of x. OK, but look. Now that you've seen it, maybe you don't immediately do a little uh, Surprise. So let's take examples because then in the everything, I mean, if you have examples, you, you, you understand these formulas much better. But I have reproduced the formulas again. So you have a random variable that in some way is an intensive random variable. What you need to do is function of a variable. And you need to do the scaled uh, cumulative generating function. And you may even put asymptotic as an additional word because you have to take this limit. And then you have this large uh, deviation, the rate function, which tells you how the probability behaves when this n is very large. So let's see. Let's do calculation. Binomial random variable. So x is 1 over n sum i going from 1 to n xi, where xi takes two values, 1 with probability p and 0 with probability 1 minus p. So I'm counting, so to say, I have, I'm in the casino, I have a certain I have probability p to win. And I make, uh, I play n times, and I wonder what is the probability for the number of wins, which I call k. And this, of course, increases as I play more. But I'm interested in an intensive variable, so I divide k by n. And of course, you expect that this x will converge to p. I mean, if you have p is the probability for winning or for having an outcome 1. So if you play n times on average, you have p times n gains. So x, which is 1 over n, this number, we go to okay. So let's calculate. So now you know what is the probability to have k wins in the binomial distribution. It's you have to choose which ones are the winning games. So you have this combinatorial factor. And then you have the p of the, uh, k of the gains have to be winning. It's probability p to the k. And the other ones is 1 minus p to the n minus Now, I don't do it here, but just now do 
I mean, here you already uh, have everything in the exponent, but for to work out this thing, you need to use the Stirling expansion, right? This is what you need, okay? And then plus, I will know what is the next term. So. But uh, if you insert this in this combinatorial factor and you identify x is k over n, you will see that this, this thing here becomes exponential of minus n times i of x, and i of x is given here. This is what you find. So this is a large deviation function. So and you see this is a function that is defined in interval 0, 1. This is obvious because, of course, this thing can at most be 1 and can be at least 0. So this, quantity, this is preserved here. You see that this quantity here, when you can check, this quantity is everywhere negative except 0 in one point, in which point x equals to p. When x is equal to p, then this is 0 and this is 0. Okay. Let's do the other way, the cumulant generating function. So I have to calculate this quantity here. So I take exponential of lambda and x to begin with, this part here. So of course, so the average is the sum. K goes from zero to n. The probability for this, and n k is, is uh, n x is k, so it's exponential lambda k. And now here with the binomium of Newton, you know, you just put the exponential of lambda under this k power here. So you have p exponential of lambda, and you have this binomial expansion of this term. Take the logarithm, divide by n. And here is the cumulant generating function. Scale to asymptotic is scale to I leave it as an exercise to show that these ones are genre transforms of each other. Okay. Another example, I mean, sorry, most many examples. This is an example with time. So that's why I put it. So Poisson variable. So I'm waiting for my for phone calls. And I wait, uh, there is a certain rate at which the calls come in. Let's, let's call it new. And I count the number of phone calls after a time t, and I call this k. Of course, this number is increasing with time. If I wait longer, I get more calls. So, so the intensive variable that is interesting is, of course, k over t, which I call x. And again, I expect that x will converge to the average rate of incoming calls. This is the estimated rate of incoming calls, if I do it like that, this is OK, what is the probability to have k calls? This is a Poisson distribution. So, don't know. So it's uh, the average to the power k exponential of minus average divided by k factorial. Again, you use Stirling, and you will find the large deviation function for x. In this case, the function which is defined for all positive x. Of course, k is a positive number, so x is a positive number. When is it 0? Of course, as I mentioned, when x is equal to nu, when x is equal to nu, this thing becomes 0. It's the only value where it's 0, otherwise it's all the same. The, the cumulant generating function is very easy to calculate. Again, it's exponential of lambda times k. So you can, again, insert this under here. And so you have the exponential development, uh, apart from this factor, which is here, the exponential development of um, of e lambda nu t, which is this term. E, e to the power lambda nu t. You develop this, you get all this, and this is x factor. You take the logarithm, this goes out. You divide by t, this goes out. You don't have even have to take the limit t going to infinity here, because this is a process with independent increment. So the, sometimes you don't even have to take the limit. In this case, you don't. And you find this is the scaled cumulative generating function. Exercise show that this is a large genre transform. Okay. So uh, what is surprising is that this uh, property here, the fact that for large parameter values, you have more than what central limit theorem or the Gaussian, uh, the, the, the law function of the central limit theorem tells you. So it's actually really first published uh, by Varadhan in the paper 1966, and also independently, I think, more said by Donsker, and they both got in 2007, so many years later, uh, the, the Abel Prize, the top prize in mathematics for this discovery. 
So maybe I should just briefly mention that, of course, in the case that, in a simple case where your uh, variable averages out, like in the central limit term to mu, so what, what, where, where do these things fit? Well, typically you will have that all the probability mass, as I showed in the two previous examples, this i of mu is zero. All the probability mass, so all the probability is expressed small except in one point where it is one. So it's, of course, it's a limit, of course. This is in the average. This is a low flash number, essentially. This tells you how you go to a delta function. More precisely than I did before. The central limit there actually corresponds to an expansion of this function around, th this is of course the maximum value. Zero is the maximum, all the other values are negative. So if you do a parabolic approximation around that point, you get the central limit. The, the, the signs are wrong. Is the i is Ah, yes, I'm sorry. Like but, the, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is the so. okay. Okay, now this is called level one large deviation functions. So on this slide, I just want to tell you this much more. A very interesting thing, and there is actually a parallel with statistical mechanics that I briefly want to mention. So if you cannot follow it immediately, I mean, you can look at it again. But so this is level one because I'm looking at a random variable. Now you can, of course, imagine that I'm do more than looking at the random variable, I could look at the vector, so a set of random variables. But if I have, for instance, a random variable, I could try to do more. I, this x converges to the average, that's good. But maybe I want not only the average, I want the probability distribution. So I could ask, is it possible to say something about the convergence of what is called in the probabilistic literature, the empirical distribution to the true distribution. The empirical distribution is to have a method to estimate what the probability distribution is and compare it to the true one. If you sample a lot, your histogram or whatever hopefully converges to the probability distribution, the true one. So you have a kind of law of large numbers, not for a variable but for a function, in this case for the probability distribution. Now it turns out that the example that I picked of this binary random variable is very uh, interesting because it is both at the same time. Let me explain. So I told you I have a random, uh, I have a binary random variable, the probability that x i is one is p, and the probability that x i is zero is one minus p. And you see, of course, I told you x converges to p, and one minus x, of course, converges to one minus. P. So in a sense, I have a convergence here not only of the random variable but of a probability distribution because probability distribution is only one number it's p and therefore here was the large deviation function that i showed to you okay so this was on the previous slide the large deviation function has this form and this has the shape of what is called a cool black leibler distance or relative entropy between two distributions what are the distributions the empirical distribution, Q, what is it? It's the estimate of what is the probability for this. This is x. And what is the probability for this? This is 1 minus x. What is the true probability is p. And what is estimate? What is the true probability for one is 1 minus p. And this d formula in general is given by that. So this is an example of a convergence of an empirical distribution to a true distribution. This is called level 2 large deviation theory. This theorem, actually, the fact that this uh, this is in, in generally true. If you have if you have independent random variables, you measure uh, and you try from these measurements to estimate the probability distribution of these random variables. Then, as you have more measurements, your estimate will converge to the true probability in the sense of large deviations. That means that if you have large enough samplings will be exponentially unlikely that you are away from the true distribution. And what is this exponential likely function? This is this rate function. It has this shape. It's very interesting shape. It's the distance, pull back like or whatever, this is between the empirical, this, this is the distribution you estimate, and this is, this is the true distribution. So it's, it is, so how far can you be off? Well, 
it depends, of course, on how long you measure. Errors go down exponentially, but the rate at which these go down is given by this specific function. This is the relative function. And you can go to an even higher level. So the higher level is, for instance, you have a Markov process, you sample from it, and you want to estimate not the steady state probability, but the transition probabilities. Okay, so this means you have now to measure subsequent pairs of variables and see how often does this guy occur, x1 with x2, x1 with x3, and so on. And you again have, I mean, uh, people have, again, the empirical, uh, the, the large deviation function in the case of a Markov process, you have here is the expression for the large deviation function in general for a Markov Okay, so then a few a few uh, additional comments. I don't know, a few additional comments. What often happens in large aviation theory, this is in a sense, I mentioned it because this is very similar to what happened in statistical physics. It is often possible to find the large deviation principle of a quite complicated quantity like this one, like the, con the transition probability. And it is difficult to get large deviation functions for simple quantities. And the reason is, well, let me give an example. Suppose I have a large deviation principle for x. And I'm interested not in x, but in y, which is a function of x. Okay. So whenever I have x, I know what y is. But when I have y, I don't know necessarily what x is. That's what the function is. So it's usually 1 to multiple. Okay. So y. There are, um, um, it's not a one to one, well, if this is invertible, it's a one to one relation, but in general it's. So, what is, a large, what, what is the, the contraction principle? If I have a large deviation principle for this guy, I have a large deviation principle for y, and the rate function of y, and this is very easy to understand, it's from all the x values that reproduce y, the minimum, minimum one. You see? So, this is, I mean, obvious eh, in a sense. So if you have an x value that gives, that is very unlikely, okay, this will this will mean not the one that is responsible for a specific y value. I mean, the x value that gives the same y value, but is more likely is the one that will be responsible for the k rate. So this is the contraction. And I have a, a mildly difficult exercise in the sense that when I start it, I have to sit down a little bit <laughs> before I realize how to do it. So mildly difficult homework is using the contraction principle. If you can do that, then I think you have understood my lecture. So that is the derived level one large deviation function by contraction from level two. So let me explain. So the level two, I had a convergence of probability distributions. I, I showed you I have a measurement of a probability distribution QI, and it converges to the true distribution PI. And for that, I gave you the large deviation function. It's this but like this thing. So I know what this rate function is. It's given by that. And then I ask to derive a level one large deviation function. See, this is not the, so Q converges to P, but now I'm only looking at how the estimate, how the average, which is QI XI, converges to the true average, which is PI XI. You see it's a contraction. So the way you have to do it, so you have to use this principle with use of Lagrange multipliers because these guys here, x, q, i, are normalized to 1 and uh, x is given by this expression. If you want to really test for the So then a last remark. Um, I mentioned this question of differentiability. So it could be that the large deviation function has such a shape if it has such a shape, and you do Laplace transformation, the Laplace principle, which I showed you, you will find the scaled cumulative generating function. And because of the switch, you know, because you have this switch from this region to this region when you do the Legendre transform, you get this non-differentiability that I showed, that I talked to you about. So this is why, when this guy is not differentiable. If you do the Legendre transform of this guy, you get the convex envelope of this one. So you don't get i of x. So that is the problem 
that is a mathematical problem that I mentioned before. If there is no, if, if the large deviation function is a nice complex function, then everything goes both directions. But if this, and this can happen, actually it happens in our group, if this happens, you get that the human generating function has a uh, cusp here, and it's not, it doesn't have enough information to, re to reproduce this. So you cannot get large deviation function from there, you only get its complex value. Okay, so there are many applications um, which I will not mention. So it's typically, I mean, stochastic process information theory, and so what is the large parameter? For instance, stochastic process, it can be time, but it can also be, for instance, one over the noise intensity. So you can do these problems. And of course, statistical physics has all the time large number of particles of, or large number, and you typically have you immediately recognize when I write, for instance, Boltzmann principle, the probability distribution is exponential of S. This is like a large deviation principle. It's exponential. S, but S is an extensive property. It's N times the entropy for your volume. OK, and now I have a few minutes left to tell you what we found. And I see that this time. Um, so let me tell you what we found. It's a uh, large aviation principle for the efficiency of machines. Why do I want to tell you this? Because it's a, the, the, the result that we found is at the same level as the discovery of the Carnot efficiency. I don't know if you remember Carnot efficiency. Carnot efficiency is what you use in thermodynamics to introduce the entropy, to introduce the Kelvin temperature, and to introduce the second law. Okay, so it's, I think, quite important. So what did we do? We basically reproduce the discussion of Carnot, but for small engines. And in small engines, everything fluctuates. And we look at what happens if you make a long time effort. So things fluctuations die out, but they don't completely disappear. And these large, these fluctuations for, when you measure for large times, are characterized by large deviations. So this is what I want to do. So here is my Carnot engine, OK? And I have first and second law. I put in heat. I get out heat plus work. I suppose the engine itself returns to its same state. So I have the first law is this. Then I have the second law that tells you the total entropy has to increase. So there is an ent entropy decrease here because I get out heat. An entropy increase here and there. The system returns to original state. If you combine these two, you see that the efficiency, this is what you uh, get out over what you put in is at most one minus the ratio of the This is kind of Now I'm going to do the same, but I replace this engine by a small engine. Okay? So, what is the first law? So, the first law is the same. Of course, I put in some heat, although the heat is now fluctuating. So, I put small capitals, a lower case, to distinguish it. So, these things here are fluctuating quantities. This is the world heat in, heat out. The system's energy can also fluctuate, but I do this again for a very long time. So the work increases, the heat increases, and the system energy more or less stays. I mean, it can fluctuate, but it's negligible for large radiation. The same for the entropy. So the entropy, I get heat out of this reservoir, so this decreases. I get heat into this reservoir, so the entropy increases, and the system entropy. Now, this quantity here, does not obey this, this uh, inequality in general because it's a fluctuating quantity. It only obeys this if you look in the textbooks on average. But what have people discovered over the last decade or so that the second law is replaced by a, a, a symmetry proper, property for the probability distribution. The symmetry property is called fluctuation theory. And it tells you that the probability for this being, say, a positive quantity delta s total, is exponentially larger. Actually, this is an equal, well, this is here for large times, but it's in, in some cases equal. But for large times, this is exponentially larger than the probability of observing the, the corresponding difference. This is a theorem which I believe to be probably as general as the second law. But we are in the process, I mean, it has been discovered and discussed in many different concepts. I cannot talk about this here. But I want, what, what, this, what convinces people is not when you form, even though you can derive it in beautiful ways, 
But if you find implications that are surprising and that you can verify. This is the way the second law was accepted. Not because laws was wrote it, because it explained phase transitions, it explained all kinds of things that people never thought would be would come from this thing. So, so this is the law that I would like to, to test. And what am I going to do? I'm going to look at the analog of the efficiency, but now the efficiency for a small machine. So I have the same W over Q of H. But this is now a random variable, because this is a random variable, this is a random variable. So I have, I have to talk about the probability distribution. And I'm going to use uh, really mean this. I'm going to use the theory of large deviations because you now more or less heard about it. So I have to switch to intensive variables. So the total work over a certain time t, I divide by t and I denote it by w t dot. The total heat, rate of heat is q over t, and the efficiency is w over q or w dot over q. Okay. And now I have a principle of large deviations in several examples where you can take it analytically. With a principle of large deviations, I mean this work and this seed, if you run long and long and longer enough, they will converge to the average value. It's a law of love, except if you're very funny machines with no machines. So and you can imagine that this approach of this uh, average values is by a theory of large deviations. So there is a function here. But this Fluctuation term that I mentioned implies, so I've rewritten it here, actually, if you, instead of the entropy, you put W and Q, which define entropy. This, this theorem that I want to prove implies, it implies that this large deviation function satisfies this problem. Now, for a reversible system, so one that is by accident reversible, because these are fluctuating quantities. So if by accident I don't have entropy produced, then this large deviation function, according to the fluctuation theorem, should be symmetric function. So this is the fantastic implication. So this thing here, if this is true for a, a realization which does, which does not produce entropy, so it realizes Carnot efficiency. You can check it from from these equations are the same as before. So if this is the DS total here is zero, if this is zero, then this efficiency is Carnot. Well, for Carnot efficiency, this is a symmetric function. And then I told you that uh, the contraction principle, what is a large deviation function? What is a large deviation function from eta? It's the minimum of the large deviation function of these two guys, which produce eta. But the minimum of this is smaller than one of the values. And one of the values of this function is when q dot is 0, it's i0, 0. zero. But if, it is I, if, if i is, is a symmetric function, then this is the minimum. And so I can, uh, I can show that the large deviation function at Carnot efficiency is um, the least problem. Okay. So I realized it was a little bit fast here, and I don't want to go over time. So I sorry. So what is the conclusion? So what we showed is you have a machine, a small machine, you let it run for a long time, you measure the efficiencies, you will find all efficiencies. If you measure long enough, it converges to the standard efficiency, which obeys the Carnot inequality, so it will be below Carnot. But you can by accident find Carnot efficiency. Well, what we show is that the, here is a large deviation function. Actually, this is a universal form. We can prove much more than what I told you. The least likely efficiency to observe, so the one that decays exponentially faster than any other one, even the ones at infinity, is the Carnot efficiency. So this is a prediction. And the, other, the ingredient is essentially the generalization of the second law, which we try to popularize it. So this is what I wanted to tell you. I'm sorry that I started late. I started The rate, yes, so it's a rate of decrease. Okay, so 
take any finite number of for the efficiency and take that no efficiency and measure longer and longer. The probability to observe this guy will exponentially decrease. To observe this Carnot efficiency will exponentially decrease, but the Carnot efficiency will the exponentially decrease faster. So if I measure long enough, it will be less likely than any finite efficiency. Because the rate of, this is what the large deviation theory tells you, it's exponential, exponential. So what is the probability for eta? It's exponential of minus t i of eta. This large deviation function. And eta uh, is always smaller than the eta c. And it is zero at the standard thermodynamic efficiency. Actually. So whenever you have an eta different from eta c and you measure long enough, this factor here will always bring you down below the efficiency of any other time. Is there somewhere system size or the particular parameter in this function? So it's because so it's okay. Microscopic system and very small. Yeah. It's a small system, so it's a, well, it's but a system. Where is the I don't. So you ask about the thermodynamic limit for the yes. system. This is the thermodynamic limit. It's a little bit well. Then you have two limits at the same time. So you, we didn't look at that for the moment. So the, the reason I will tell you why. It's a small system time going The reason why we are, so we know of, in, of course, those of us who work in this fluctuation theorem, to observe if these effects, you have to work at the order of kT, of a few kT. As soon as you go to larger energies or volumes, these things are also exponentially suppressed. So everything becomes exponentially small, and you, you don't want to do exponentials in, inside of exponentials. So it has to be a small system. But I forgot to mention, uh, when this result, our result became available, uh, I already know about an experiment in Barcelona where they have seen. So what you expect is that the probability distribution for eta If you measure long enough, okay, the probability distribution, it has somewhere a maximum, which is at the most probable or whatever. And they found this, they saw this in their experiments. So these are experiments with very small machines and they have to, to mean it's not easy. But they already found this very funny feature here that there was a minimum developing somewhere. It's not exactly Carnot because their situation is slightly more complicated than the one I have. But it's in agreement with what we did. And everybody who hears about it is very surprised. Everybody would think, oh, the Carnot is a more, I mean, it can certainly not be the least efficient. It's, it's really a minimum. It's first of all. And when you have a, a physical explanation, it's <coughs> So if I would, what would be my dream is to do what Carnot or what Carnot in all these guys did. So they started from this observation and derived the second law. So what I would like, I'm not able to do it, is that if I assume this feature, can I, for instance, derive the fluctuation term? So can I go in the other, is there a kind of, because in, in the normal Carnot efficiency, these things are equivalent. If you have the second law, you can derive Carnot and the, the impossibility of a perpetual motion. You can also go the other way. So it's a kind of, so here we, we don't have that, but also, intuitive, no. Um, if somebody comes up with a good reason, I would have to hear about it. Not the fun case. Yeah, we can make a, we can make now a 5 minute break. Okay.